the, the recreation in Google Earth. Now again, this is available to all of us through the work that NASA and others have done to make it possible to see topography and pictures. This information is satellite and, and aviation data. And you'll see that, uh, and of course, it comes with a great soundtrack and so forth and so on. And again, someone else, just like me flying out Mount Everest, this is perhaps a person who's unlikely to be flying his own F-18 in the middle of the Swiss Alps, can really recreate this. Um, and it's just a phenomenal experience. We have many, many technologies coming that are like this over the next little while. Why we, in fact, here's a picture of the, um, of the fake pilot. There's a picture of the real pilot. So this author even inserted a picture of himself in it. Let's, uh, let's move to our next one. When I think about um, this whole phenomena, how we use information, I then think about scale. And I was trying to think about what's the best example that I can use about scale. And I was trying to think about, um, well, there's the moon sort of nearby. So what we've done now is we've simply taken imagery of the moon. Thank you, NASA. Uh, it's, by the way, moon.google.com in case you want to go visit the moon um, if you're not currently planning on a moon mission anytime soon. Uh, and here we are. And let's go visit where Neil Armstrong went. And you can, you'll see that we can, in fact, get to the point where you can see a picture of his, of his footprints. Now, the kind of stuff that I'm talking about, we're we did under a Space Act agreement with NASA. And we're showing not just NASA planetary content, as we've discussed, but also we're working on disaster response. Here's a picture of uh, Neil Armstrong's footprints. Again, these pictures are collaborated, are, are given to us by NASA and others. This mechanism is generically available on all of Google Earth. So again, showing off what we can do. Let's keep going. Now, if you're, in, if you're on the moon, perhaps what you're really interested in is space. So let's go to a, I don't know, this is a particular interesting star field. This star field is, uh, looks like a normal star field. Um, it was actually done in the uh, Deep Space Initiative with the Hubble. And this is a picture of the, and to give you an example, the, the width of that picture is somewhere around 10 to the 25 centimeters, which is a number that is, um, here, here's an analogy for you. If, the, if um, the interaction between carbon atoms is maybe one, uh, 1 over 10 to the minus 12th, in terms of the way they interact, and 10 to the 12th is on the order of 100,000 years, so what you're seeing is you're seeing something that has the scale or width of something you've never seen before. There's nothing in the world of this scale. This is the deepest image. It's also the most, the oldest image we have in history because it was done approximately 13 billion years ago, roughly 10% of what we believe the, the life of, of the universe is. Uh, and it was not done with one picture, by the way. The Hubble went around and took picture after picture after picture because there was so little light. Pretty neat, OK? So you say normal picture. Let's see where that picture is in context. So you get a sense of how far it really is. Oh, it looks like a pretty normal star field. Uh, and by the way, there are billions and billions of stars and uh, galaxies, even in this field. As we move out, we begin to see that perhaps this is a tiny, tiny little piece of a tiny, tiny little constellation that doesn't even show up on our constellation map as we go deeper and deeper and deeper in both time and in history, some of our constellations begin to show up. And now we begin to see what is familiar to us. There is no tool and there is no feature I know of on Earth that can show you a resolution that goes from 1 to 10 to the 25th in that amount of time. That's what NASA can do. That's what information technology can do. And that's, frankly, why we all work at Google. Uh, let's thank Robin for the demo. And uh, let, me keep, let me keep talking. Um, so, so if you think about it, what you really do is you set up audacious goals. And you make this all happen. But you cannot possibly anticipate the challenges that you have to surmount. 
it's clear that the assumptions will change. And you cannot predict the innovations that engineers will make. Um, the internet architecture was invented in 1970, 1973. Uh, the World Wide Web was invented in 1991, 1992. Um, the protocols that, that we deal with every day now that are so commonplace were not even thought about 20 years until 20 years after the original design. That is a remarkable achievement of, of technology and computer science. There's no way to, 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 to understand how people will take advantage of this technical innovation. A man in Italy used Earth, Google Earth, to discover the remains and antiques of an ancient Roman villa literally in his backyard. Uh, archaeologists in France used Google Earth to um, discover 100 candidate sites for ancient uh, Celtic settlements. Uh, in the search for these various uh, meteor craters and impact craters, they're using the satellite imagery from NASA and the other work in order to actually do real science on how the Earth was formed and shaped. We didn't anticipate all of this. We just put the data out there and people did it. Um, it's also clear to me that the people who start the mission are not the ones that are going to complete it. An interesting fact that I, I did in researching this is that the average age in the front room for Apollo 11 was about 32. Uh, the average age of Google was about 31. The memory of the IBM 360s, I used as a, a young programmer an IBM 36091, which will both date me and also give you'll have a sense of sympathy for me. Um, <laughs> 2.5 megabits in core memory, a real cores. Uh, the memory of the iPod that our average employee carries now is 80 gigabytes, which is 256,000 times 2.5 megabits. So the, the rate of change here has been so phenomenal. It's, it's of the scale that I just showed you in that star field. So the internet is the fastest growing communications medium in history. Again, so fitting that we're here at, the, at this wonderful museum. Uh, more than 1.3 billion internet users worldwide um, on the order of a couple hundred million new users every year. Eight hours of video get uploaded to YouTube uh, every day, actually every minute. And there's 70 million blogs exist and 120,000 created every day. It's a lot of blogs and a lot of writers, not so many readers, I suspect. <laughs> um, when, you, when you, this democratization of information, which is fundamental to what is occurring here, has a lot of implications for both NASA and for Google and for the world here in Washington. Um, the, since anyone can create, edit, publish, and share information, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a new jump ball. It's a new, a new scenario. And normally what happens is that the rate of progress in, in fields occurs at a relatively predictable rate. Um, examples would be that scientific research, the number of page, papers doubles every 15 years. So sort of predictable rate. In astronomy, the, uh, since we're sort of talking about astronomy right now, the distance to the farthest galaxy we can see has doubled roughly every 10 years. So again, reasonable rates. The world that I live in, doubling times are much, much shorter. Moore's Law, of course, everybody knows about this. Processing power doubles every 18 months. That means, by the way, 10 times every five years, 100 times in, uh, in 10. There's a, a law called Kreider's Law, which is that memory, disk memory in particular, doubles every 12 months. So these immense, immense amounts of data stores being created over and over again. So uh, an obvious example is that in 2019, uh, an iPod-type device uh, would be able to contain 85 years of video. In other words, you could never watch it. You'd be dead. You're going to be carrying it, and you'll say, well, I couldn't watch it. I'm sorry, I died. Uh, I mean, it's actually a serious problem. Like, you know, it's going to cause a lot of stress. Um, you know, if I'd only lived another year longer, I could have watched that other episode. Uh, so the other interesting thing about this, this dispersion of information is that there's a lot of new voices and new ideas. With all that, with all that content out there, you know, search is obviously what Google does, uh, becomes more important than ever. Over 20% of the searches that we do every day are for items we haven't seen in at least the last 90 days. So people are naturally curious.